All right, so just before we jump into the video for today, I want to take a quick second to let everyone know that in addition to the Sion vlog for today, I have uploaded a video to my Patreon page about the journey from Shanghai to Sion. This is a more behind the scenes type of vlog and I give you everything you need to know about how to ride China's incredible high speed rail system. So if you're interested, I'll leave the link here and you can go and check that out. All right, enough of that. Let's get into the actual video for today. The thing about China is that it will always surprise you. Xi'an is China's ancient capital. Dating from the 3rd century BCE, Xi'an was once the original seat of imperial China under the Qin dynasty. Today, it is a bustling city at the crossroads of very old and very new. And this is a very good picture of <laughs> old and new. It's got a young, energetic vibe that feels worlds apart from the mega metropolis of Shanghai that I just came from. Located in the heart of central eastern China, Xi'an is the capital and largest city of Shanxi province. This location proved to be quite beneficial for China in the Middle Ages, as Xi'an served as the terminus, or beginning, depending on your direction, of the Silk Road, a tentacle-like collection of trading routes that spanned thousands of kilometers across the deserts of northwestern China, Central Asia, and ultimately, into Europe and the Near East. This long history of traders, settlers, and caravanserai traversing through Xi'an has created a cultural melting pot here. Islam, for example, likely brought here by Arab traders along the Silk Road in the Middle Ages, is ever-present in modern-day Xi'an. The largest non-Uyghur Muslim population in China resides right here in Xi'an, as does China's largest mosque. Along with that, Xi'an is home to numerous Chinese Islamic dishes and foods not readily found elsewhere in China. It is a fascinating city to wander, to eat, to explore. Central Xi'an consists primarily of the old city, surrounded by the city walls, towering massive stone fortifications built during the Ming Dynasty to house people, food, and armies. Good morning from the ancient capital of Xi'an here in central eastern China. Where I'm at right now is the city wall. And in Xi'an, you can actually walk along the city wall. It is a 14 or so kilometer rectangle. Now you can walk the entire length of this wall. It takes about four hours. It's large, it's quite large. You could also rent bikes and you could cycle around the wall. I haven't seen any yet, but there are bikes for rent at some of the gates. There are four gates, north, east, west, and south. And you can enter the wall through any of those points. Now, although the city might be 3,000 years old, this wall is not. <laughs> Originally built in 1372, of course, it is restored. If you look at it, it is in really good shape. There's beautiful red lanterns all lining the entire wall and they've done quite an extensive restoration process on this, and it is very gorgeous. But the structure 
does date to 1372, but of course it's been restored. So this is my first technical stop on my journey along China's Silk Road. And it's an important destination for anyone venturing along China's Silk Road because this city was the original Silk Road terminus or starting point, depending on which direction you were going. And let's say you were heading east to west, so from China into the Middle East and Europe, this is where you would have started. Now, necessarily, no one actually ever traveled the entire length of the Great Silk Road. I'm sure someone maybe attempted it, but it was extremely long, about 6,400 kilometers, and it was rife with dangers. Traveling through parts of the world, like China's northwestern deserts and the high plains and plateaus of Central Asia, for long stretches of time, posed you with serious risks like starvation, being eaten by wild animals, dehydration, banditry, robbery, kidnapping, and slavery. It, it, it was a very dangerous place and a very wild part of the world. Trading along the Silk Road, for the most part, occurred in a piecemeal fashion where people would meet in trading cities, dispel or disperse ideas and religion, spices, and other goods, animals. People would then go back to wherever they came from, bringing those new ideas and those new foods and cultural identities with them. And that is essentially how the Silk Road functioned. And Xi'an was the major starting and ending point for that. Not only is Xi'an the original Silk Road terminus or starting point, but this was actually China's original ancient capital. This city dates back 3,000 or so years, and it was the seat of the first dynasty in China, the Qin Dynasty, consolidated by Emperor Qin, the same individual who was responsible for the Terracotta Army. And this city as a bustling trading center for hundreds of years along the Silk Road has led to the spread of something very interesting here in Xi'an. And that is the spread of Islam. Brought here likely in the Middle Ages by Arab traders along the Silk Road, this is actually today the largest community of non-Hui Muslims or non-Uyghur Muslims in China. And with that comes a very bustling Muslim quarter here in the old city of Xi'an. So somewhat unrelated to the Muslim quarter is this 14th century structure in front of me known as the drum tower. And its original function was to beat a large drum to signify the end of the day. And so every afternoon or evening, they would beat a large drum to, again, signify the end of the day. Not far from here is also another 14th century structure known as the bell tower, which had the opposite purpose of beating a bell every morning or ringing a bell every morning to signify the start of the day at dawn. And so we'll come back here at night because at night when this is all lit up, it is quite beautiful. But just on the other side of it is the start of the Muslim quarter and that's where we're gonna head now. And today is a Saturday. And so as you can tell, it is very, very busy. Bang bang? Oh, yeah. Bang bang. Yeah. Now along with this Muslim population in this part of the city and in Xi'an in general, there is a very there are very unique food specialties that you can find only here in Xi'an. One of these is called Biang Biang noodles. Represented by this symbol up here, 
the most complex character in the Chinese language with 58 strokes. That represents uh, the phrase biang, it's onomatopoeic. And it's meant to represent the sound of noodles slapping against a metal table, hand-pulled noodles slapping against a metal table. So it's onomatopoeic. And they are thick, almost like paparadel pasta noodles that you find here in Xi'an. And they're called biang bang noodles. Biang biang noodles. Something else that is very, very common here is a soup slash broth called, I'm sure I'm gonna butcher this, but it's called paomo. And it is a soup of breadcrumbs, basically. You are served bread and you break it up into tiny pieces, put it in your bowl, and then someone comes around with broth and puts it over the breadcrumbs that kind of soak up the broth and it forms like a thick stew. That's what I'm trying to find right now. So I have to get off of this main street, get onto one of the more quieter streets, and uh, basically go to the main food street here in the Muslim Quarter to find it. So once you get off of that main street behind me, which I will put the name below what that main street is, and you get into these back alleys, you start to see the real life here uh, in the Muslim Quarter. The Great Mosque of Sion is just down the way here, and the main food street for the Muslim Quarter is this way too. The street behind me is a food street, but it's more for tourists, it's more for people taking Instagram photos, and uh, it's not really a place that you're gonna find the most authentic types of food. <laughs> So there's like ticky tacky souvenir markets back here. It looks like it just kind of keeps going down that way for like souvenir shopping. And then this is the mosque. It's a very interesting mosque because it's like East Asian architecture. But this is uh, the great mosque of Sion. I think you have to pay a ticket to get in. So it's 25 won in the busy season, which is now. So how about this? Let's eat and then we'll come back and check out the Great Mosque because I am starving and I got to get some food. So the bread that I was talking about for um, Paomo, which again, I'm mispronouncing, is this right here. It's this bread right here. This is what it looks like after it's been cooked. And they're actually making it right here by hand. And they just let me go in there for a minute and uh, see how they were doing it. And really, really interesting the way they're all rolling it out by hand. And, and there's little like, uh, I guess like rivets on the bread. So it's like, uh, I don't know, undulated I guess is the word. And that's from like his hand smacking the dough while he's kneading it, which is really, really interesting. But anyway, this is the main food street here in the Muslim Quarter. This is where you're gonna find, I think probably the highest concentration of good authentic food, possibly in this entire city. Ah, cold noodles. Let's try these first, actually. Let's give the, let's try these first. This is another, this is called Liang Pi. And they're like cold, um, they're like cold noodles. They basically make the noodles and then they leave them out to get uh, like cold. And then they douse them in like chili oil and vinegar with shredded cucumbers on top. And they're really, really good. So let's give, give these a try first. Hi, uh, can I just uh, do the one, one, yeah. This? No, 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 no. Just the uh, noodle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, see again. Cool. Thanks. Oh, thank you. 
Ah, nice. Mixing it up for me. Hello. Yeah, Liang, Liang P? Yeah. Ah, thank you. This is Ice Peak, local soda that you have here. It goes really well with these noodles. And these are the noodles, actually. So they come in all different variations. This one has sesame sauce. Almost all the time you'll see them with chili, chili oil and vinegar and shredded cucumber on top. And these are actually wheat noodles because this is typically a dry part of China. It doesn't rain here nearly as much as it does in some other parts. So rice is not a staple crop here, it's wheat. And so these noodles are actually wheat noodles as opposed to rice, which you find elsewhere in China. Mm. Classically, you will see these served with something called a rujiamo, which is like basically a Chinese hamburger, if you will. It's shredded meat or beef or mutton in between two crispy leaven flatbreads, basically. Um, and it's kind of like the Sion trio. It's like these noodles, liangpi, rujiamo, the Chinese hamburger, and an ice pack. <laughs> Sion Happy Meal, if you will. I don't really like the rujiamo, to be honest. It's very good, but it's very dry. But for me, these noodles are, are king. These are just fantastic. Quite spicy, too. There's a lot of chili oil on here, which is nice. Okay, so that was delicious. And they were telling me, so the name of the soup is pao mua. I think that's how you say it, pao mua, which basically just means like pita bread soaked in broth. And they told me to go 50 meters down the street here to find it. Hello, hi. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. Oh, the other thing, wow, this is so busy, look at this. The other thing that's super common that you see here is pomegranate juice, which uh, you find everywhere in the Muslim quarter. I guess pomegranates are super uh, common here. Look, see they're even, this is like the pomegranate juicer here. They're like making the juice. I think I might get one. Uh, yeah, one uh, pomegranate juice, just one. So I think it's, it's is it this? Uh, okay, so it's 15 won, I think she's saying. 15, 60, 70, she, she. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, pomegranate juice, it's really good. It's very fresh. Um, okay, so they told me to go 50 meters down the street to find, to find this soup. Oh, wow. Something you see a lot, too, is kebabs. Everywhere. Hello. Uh, this is probably where they were talking about. Because I see it on the menu. Yeah, let's go in here. So... Um, how am I? Ah, okay. I think I said that right, maybe. I just pointed to a bowl of uh, bread. Thank you. Let me look, let me look. Yeah, I need, a, I need to translate the menu. This is gonna take me a second. My translating app is not working for this at all. Oh, that's because I'm on English. Uh, mutton. Yang rou. Hold, hold on. So here's how this works. You, you get your bowl of pita bread. People laugh when I use cash because they don't use cash here. Okay, so this is what you get. You get your bowl with bread in it. 
and you have to break these up into really, really tiny pieces, and then they come over with the broth, and they pour it on top. Basically, they asked, do I want mutton or, or beef? I went with mutton, so let's break this up. And for what I understand, they need to be small, like really small pieces. Wow, this is dense. This is very, very thick bread. I was wondering how this would not get soggy with the bread, but I think now I understand because these are really, really thick, dense pieces of bread. Wow, it's like actually even hard to break apart. This is gonna take me a minute. I could see how this would be a social activity at the table where everyone kind of sits around and talks while you break up your bread. <laughs> okay, so I have finished the uh, arduous task of ripping up my pita bread and now I am ready for my broth. The pomegranate juice is great. Uh, so, I think they just took the bowl to put broth in it. And I will get it back. Presumably. Thank you. Wow, that is a lot of food. All right, so here it is. This is really big. Oh, there's noodles in it. Oh, I see, okay. I see. So I'm gonna add a little chili to it. A little chili oil. Mix that up. Wow, I put a lot of chili oil in there. <laughs> yeah, wow, this smells great. And uh, also, this is humongous. All right. Yeah, so it has like vermicelli, like basically like glass noodles in it. And then, um, yeah, let's give it a shot and try not to get it on my microphone. We'll try the bread. Let's try the bread pieces. These bread pieces have the consistency, exactly, of homemade and yaki. I know that because my 90-year-old grandmother still makes gnocchi by hand. It almost actually tastes like it too, but it definitely has a very similar mouthfeel, almost exactly. Mm. This is so hot, but the basic flavor is mutton, the flour from the bread, which tastes, again, kind of similar to like undressed and yaki. For all you out there, it's and yaki, and yaki. That's how you say it. Yeah, nice big like fatty piece of mutton, which I'm not sure here if it's goat or if it's sheep. In some parts of the world, it means different things. In Hunza Valley, mutton is sheep, but in Bangladesh, mutton is goat. So to me, it tastes like sheep. It doesn't taste like goat, but I could be wrong. They're very, very similar meats. I prefer sheep a lot better, but. And the longer it sits, the thicker it gets from the bread. If I've ever eaten peasant food in my life, and I have eaten a lot of peasant food, this is probably the best example of peasant food I can think of. It's literally bread and broth and noodles. The meat is probably a new addition, let's be honest. They probably didn't have that in the Silk Road times. But this is a really good example of using what you have that is not very expensive and finding a way to make it taste good and be filling at the same time. Because one bowl of this, I could eat one bowl of this and probably keep me full for the whole day. Mm. All right, so that was fantastic. I have the leftovers in my backpack because there's no way I finished it. But let's take a walk back through the market and then uh, we'll head over to the Grand Mosque because I want to go inside that for sure and uh, check it out. But I just walked past this guy's butcher shop and uh, 
Look at how old school this is. Niyama. He's got all this meat up on the actual like metal meat hooks. See that? That is old school, man. She she. That is uh, really old school. Sun is finally coming out. And uh, this street is a lot busier than it was even just a little bit ago. And the thing about this, wow, look at this. Just food on top of food. It's everywhere. The whole street, both sides, it's just all food. Man, I don't even know what this is. Wow. Look at all the spices, all the chili powders and chili oil. This is chicken. So I've seen this at a couple other places. Inside here are whole chickens. There are the chickens right there. And then they use this big ass rock to keep this metal grate on top of it so none of it boils over. You can see how many chilies there are in it too. Like. It's probably just fire spicy. It looks so good. Yeah. Tripes. Yeah. Hello. What is it called? Sa ah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. <laughs> cool, thank you. This is actually the first time I've seen sun in four days. It has been pouring rain here. Um, since I got here, like not, not just like raining, but like actual downpours like all day up until today. So this is definitely the place to eat in Xi'an in the old city, no doubt. There's just so many food options here. And this is during the day. Here's more of the cold noodles. It's very delicious. Yeah, the liang pi, right? Seven, seven yuan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had uh, earlier. I had. Hey, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, where are you from? Uh, USA. Oh. C uh, California. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> All right, so that is where we just came from, and this way is back towards the mosque. So let's head that way. I think your main risk here is getting hit by one of these scooters. Hello. Hello. Can I just do one? one. Yeah. 25. Okay. Hello. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Wow, this is spectacular. So this is the Great Mosque of Xi'an. Here's how big it is. So we're right here. And it goes all the way. It's like an entire city block. It's trippy to be in a mosque, but with East Asian architecture and Chinese script. Wow. I did not, by any stretch, realize how big it was in here. 
It is massive. So, let's go this way. Such a beautiful courtyard. I'm glad I waited too for the sun to come out because it was really cloudy earlier. And now it's just so, so pretty. Yeah, this is really something else. This is all Arabic, I believe. Inscripted on this stone, or inscribed on this stone. And then here's the Chinese. And this central pagoda here is really gorgeous. Wow, this is beautiful. This, everything in this, in this mosque is just so pretty. So yeah, like I was saying, Islam came here from likely Arab traders along the Silk Road. People originating in what is now present day Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, but at the time was Persia. But Islam started to take hold in the Middle East, in what is today the Middle East and North Africa, as well as the Iberian Peninsula, modern day Spain and Portugal, sometime around the fifth century, which would have been at the height of the Silk Road. So this mosque actually dates to 742 CE, which makes a lot of sense. That's about three to 400 years after the rise of Islam in the Middle East. And so it's spread along the Silk Road must have taken at least that long to reach central China. Much of that history is actually inscribed on those stone tablets that we saw earlier in this pavilion right in front of me. And I believe some of those, probably the one that's covered, are actually original, <laughs> like dating from the 8th century. So that is really amazing. But I am getting completely destroyed by mosquitoes. As you can tell, I'm wearing this jacket now. It is not cold. <laughs> I'm wearing it just to keep my arms covered. I have about 15 fresh mosquito bites on me, so I am going to head out of the mosque now. And I promised you that we would see the drum tower at night. The sun is setting now, so let's go take a look at the drum tower all lit up at night. Mm -hmm. 